I'm Alexander Williamson here with the Secret History of Living in Your Aquarium and we have an awesome invitation today with Mike here at Imperial Tropicals and Mike tell us about this place like what is going on here it's absolutely huge your fish are beautiful what's the story of this place how, how old is it and I mean what what kind of numbers do you do what kind of fish do you sell like yeah. what what's going on well thanks for having me on and thanks for coming by yeah you know, always like um, you know talking to people and yeah the, all the cool things that we work with here yeah we've been doing this a long time and we uh we are obsessed with fish <laughs> we uh we are obsessed with fish <laughs> yeah right? we have um when you call it uh, multiple tank syndrome we have that to a very uh, big extreme level so yeah i'm actually a very big fish holder myself right? <laughs> I'm always getting in fish. I'm like, man, we can't sell them. We got to keep them and try to breed them. So yeah, you know, we're very excited um, just to be able to do this for a living. Like, wow. Uh, yeah. Feel, feel very privileged. So, and this is in your blood, huh? Yes. Yes. So okay. For, uh, so for three generations, my grandfather wow. and my father in 1970 started breeding um, aquarium fish. Wow. And that's uh, how the family first got introduced to breeding fish and then that's been 52 years ago. Wow. Um, the third generation. And it's, um, so it's always been in my lifeblood, but it really took me uh, becoming a, a full fledged. I always loved fish, but when I decided to do this for, you know, a living yeah. plus years ago, I'm yeah. like, I want to learn what makes it tick with people. And, yeah. You know, so I really started getting into the different groups of fish, the L numbers and the different corridors, catfish, yeah. all the different tetras, then I like the Africans, the Tanganyikans, so it's just, you know, sent me to all different parts of the world learning about these fish. Yeah, and I mean, it's really interesting because you guys have, in, I mean, incredibly high quality and beautiful fish in just your, I mean, these are your selling tanks, yeah? Down tanks. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I love to see the hobby moving more into a phase of not being this is the sterile glass box that I have but yeah. a little bit of algae is okay some tannins some yeah. driftwood I mean what do fish look like in the wild what are they living in the wild they're in yeah. mulm they're in leaves they're in and I understand wanting to have an aquascape tank that looks pristine yeah. and I get that inclination but at the same time understanding what the fish live in in the wild and what yeah. makes them healthy it's it's an important part too that I think now people like you are really bringing into uh, even like the breeding you guys do it's it's really amazing that you guys keep it so I mean you really try to if if they have I noticed you have tannins to throw in yeah. you know if if they do that you're not just adding a bottle of chemicals automatically yeah. and it shows I mean the the things you feed your fish people uh, in Europe it's common to go to your local pet store and get Daphnia, Ammonia, um, like uh, live black worms. Yeah. And that's not here, that's not but you guys feed all that. And they get all the omega-3s, the omega-6s, the anthocyanins, the carotenoids, all those subtle compounds yeah. that just add to the electric color of, of, our, of the fish you have here, plus the sunlight when the ones you guys spawn outside and yeah. grow out. It's just, it's really impressive, Mike. I, I, I really... I appreciate it. We work really hard at it. Yeah. It's not, it's not just, um, you know, an easy task. And, right. Um, but the results um, do, do show. It's just, um, you know, an easy task. And, right. Um, but the results um, do, do show, you know, from yeah. taking that kind of attention to detail about the fish's needs. And um, you, you really see a much... Uh, better, um, healthier fish, and then, you know, one thing is that there's a lot of new people that's gotten into the hobby. Sure, the especially, years yeah, the lockdown, COVID. yeah. Um, and we want to start them off right, and I'm just blown away how, you know, we get customers say, hey, this is my first time keeping fish, and they give me a breakdown of everything they did to prepare it. I'm like, wow, that is impressive. Like, it's a change, isn't it? Like, <laughs> yeah. You just gain, like, 20 years of fish knowledge, and just by doing research on YouTube and, and the internet and communicating with us. And um, and so what happens is they become a successful keeper and then they set up more tanks or their friends and family see their setup. Yes. Because you know, one thing that I've always heard a lot is from people that aren't in the aquarium hobby and I tell them what I do, they're like, wow, that must be really difficult because I've tried keeping fish before and always, you know, they die and yeah. the tank crashes and I... 
you know, I'm, I'm like, well, how did you get started? And they're like, well, I went down to a chain store and they, yep. they sold me a tank, sold me fish, told me to go home, pour all these chemicals in the yeah. tank, and I put the fish in there. And I'm like, well, you just skipped over, you know, all the critical stuff yeah. by rushing it. And, you know, but, you know, they think that the job is really difficult. But when you do everything right, it's a lot more enjoyment. So you oh, got yeah. a lot more likelihood of, of staying in the hobby and maintaining a tank, you know, by having the correct setup. Well, there's nothing like having your fish spawn for the first time when you're yeah. keeping. I mean, it, there's it, it's really cool to yeah. feel like you've fostered a, a, an ecosystem and environment that is good enough for them to feel like they're in the wild, that's you know? The best feeling, and that's usually when more tanks get set up. Yeah. Like, well, yeah. I want to have a tank set up for, to grow out the babies, and, you know, because then they talk to us, I'm like, well, you know, if you really want the babies to survive, you really need to like separate them from their parents. And yeah, um, our our delivery guy um, for propane had always wanted to set up tanks. So I'm like, hey, go on. You know, back then it was Craigslist, and find you a used tank. Right. And I was like, when you get it set up, you know, I told him what he needed to do. Let me know, and I sent him home with his first tank with a pair of bushy nose. Like a week later, they're in. I told him to put a cave. They're in a cave spawning. Yeah, yeah. A week later, they're spawning, and then I'm like, some ancestress. Yeah, yeah. So then he, then he says, okay, what I need to do? I said, well, you need to set up another tank, and and before you know it, like literally two years probably go by. He said, man, I got problems. Like I, I got a tank on my kitchen table now, and my wife said I've gone too far. He's like, all <laughs> yeah, my house. Since then, he's moved to uh, Pennsylvania. Now he's up there, dedicated in the hobby, joined the local fish club, still in touch with me to this day. And, Super and cool. he's passing that on to his kids because a lot of- And community, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. We're seeing a lot of people uh, get into it. They're like, hey, I kept fish when I was a kid with my parents and yeah. my parents. And that, that sticks with these children, yeah. you know, where they remember like, I remember having a tank as a kid. It was such an enjoyment, so. Well, and for me, um, I have personal, uh, people on my channel know with, uh, anxiety PTSD and pain chronic pain yeah. for me it was literally a life saving life changing hobby life saving yeah. hobby and I meet so many like ex vets people yeah. you know chronic illness uh, disabilities and it, it really is I mean it can be such a fulfilling and and, like you said, and moving life saving for yeah people that are, and the world is so crazy yeah, yeah the world's crazy I mean, right now just to be able to sit in front of nature and, yeah. and enjoy it, I think it's um, it's great. And one thing that I really like is that people are learning about these fish, what their needs are. They're learning how critical it is that we do protect our nature that we, right. that we have left and not throwing trash out on the road and, and not yeah. allowing pollutants to, yeah. to hurt the waterways. And, well, and you guys are really impressive. I mean, people will see in the video, we tour the whole farm and you guys are very impressive way you're handling the water and the you know just everything the way it's done well, it, it would be near impossible with all the birds and all the things that go on down here in florida yeah. and yet it, it's it looks great you know so well, we take pride in our work and like it's um the satisfaction of um you know the work of these fish and watching them grow up it's uh you know it's awesome we love it yeah awesome all right, so here we have some beautiful frontosas in a beautiful show tank here at Imperial Tropicals. And in here, we have some of the most beautiful geos I've seen and one of the largest plecos I've ever seen. That is a beautiful pleco. Wow. Holy smokes, that thing is like almost two feet long, a foot and a half long. Beautiful fish. They're all colored up incredibly. You can tell these fish are so well taken care of. These are some lucky fish. And this is not all. There are tanks upon tanks. I mean, look at this. There are hundreds of cardinals in here and angels just looking beautiful as well as some of these Corydoras that are scuttling around the bottom on some pristine looking sand. Very, very cool that this is right where you come in 
and all these tanks are full of just beautiful, incredible quality fish. It is really something else. These are some breeding groups we have pulled to the side that you know we kind of keep as like backup groups. So most of all these species we have you know a larger breeding group down in the, the breeding areas. But, yeah. Um, it's nice for us to be able to keep them up here where they're on display. We still pull fry from them regularly and then it helps us keep our strains you know from crossing because as you can see most of these female sure. peacocks they all look very very similar. Right so, it's like guppies almost. Yeah. And I mean just the metallics the iridophores on, on the scales of those fish are just incredible. Yeah they're very nice strains. Most of these are either um, you know, German lines that we've acquired or we've acquired them as wild stock. So you guys look across the world for the best lines, bring them in, and then breed them here and kind of try to optimize that with the setup that we'll see in this video later. Yeah. And uh, we, we definitely look all over the world for quality strains because um, it's hard to get good strains in the U.S. There's a lot more yeah. available now in the hobby than there was 10 years ago because more people are tuned in to bringing in this really rare and unique stuff so um, it's just the wholesale market had been lacking good quality fish yeah. for a long time so we couldn't just order these from a wholesaler you know and say oh we want to breed these fish so well and I feel like the the kind of local pet store being a quality store kind of died for a while when you had the big box stores move in and some people only have big box stores yeah. and then when you get kind of monocultures of Here's the set 200 fish. Yeah. It kind of, um, to some people, stagnates or something becomes boring. But then, you know, now it's been long enough that where, for instance, you might have been bored of one thing, you come and revisit that strain in the way that it should look yeah. rather than a, a tired line that, you know, might have been the discount fish at a big box store. Yeah. And it really brings new life into, into what we're seeing. You know, and I think our... American style of fish keeping has improved dramatically. Yeah. Thankfully, because of YouTube videos like the work sure. that you do, oh, and well, thank you. you know, yeah. just letting people know that hey, you know, if you want to see these fish work properly, you have to have the proper tank, tank mates, the proper yeah. diet, then the healthy environment to get that fish to really look like what you see on, you know, pictures, right. or videos. Um, so we, we've really done a good job with trying to educate you know, our customer base to how to best get these fish to work, you know, the best. Yeah. Boy, these guys are active. Yeah, they're active. They're really shy, though, as soon as you get... Yeah, the, you know, the I notice, yeah. yeah. I should stay farther back. Yeah. <laughs> they're really pretty, though. I mean, yeah. it's... Males are stunning. Uh, it's so, I mean, obviously, it would be, be impossible in a video of any length to cover everything, but I mean... Yeah. What do we have going on as we walk through here? I'll kind of so show that's, uh, folks. That's part of the African section. African, okay. And then over here you get into our soft water fish. Okay. These are some fish that we brought in, uh, what, about a week ago, I think, Mike. Uh, Little th thread finicaras? Yeah, or? albino thread finicara. And there is some really talented breeders. Um, one is a good friend of ours in Indonesia. Okay. That works on breeding like really rare stuff. Yeah. Um, and so we brought these in um, about a week ago and they're, you know, one thing about it when we do bring in a shipment like that, we don't just turn around and sell it. We keep these fish. I mean, they have a red X on them, not because they're sick, but because they're in quarantine. Right Under now. observation. Yeah, so they'll be that way for a couple of weeks. And then once they are looking 100% healthy, then we will start, you know, shipping these fish out. Uh, one like real exciting fish, they're so small, you won't be able to see them on your camera. Oh yeah. What is the L280s, the world's smallest hypensistrous? The world's smallest yeah. hypensistrous. And oh wow, yeah. L280s, huh? Yeah. Are these, are they the little polka dot ones? Yes, yes. They're like a, almost like a snowball. Yeah, like a snowball. I think there's some debate whether they are in the hypensistrous. So, I have three plecos very close to that that I got at a uh, locally in Seattle, and they've only gotten that big. And is that? I mean, how big do those get? About that big. Yeah, you're probably. I wonder at, like, if that's two what that half inches. It could be. Yeah. The fish comes from Venezuela. Venezuela, yeah. And they're very difficult to get. Yeah. Uh, out of the wild where their location is. So yeah. 
They're well, not very it, prominent in the hobby yet, but there's several breeders in the U.S. that are breeding them now. So, well, think, Ve Venezuela, Colombia. I mean, you had the FARC. You had all sorts of crazy yeah. militia groups, and then government takeovers, and all sorts of things to deal with there, and tariffs and embargoes. Yes. So, I mean, it's really interesting how the hobby kind of ebbs and flows as yeah. we're allowed to bring in different things. Yeah, I mean, at one point they thought the blue eye Kikos uh, Panakis were extinct from the wild, but you come to find out that that fork wasn't allowing right. the, the collect of the fishermen. It was so dangerous that they weren't going into the areas to collect them because right. they were dangerous. So, ironically, I mean, it's happened in Myanmar too with like Lake Inlay, the Shan province where like CPD, uh, Sabwa Resplendent, some of the other fish come from, sometimes, I mean, war can be terrible, don't get me wrong, for fish and obviously humans, but sometimes it kind of in a way like preserves an area because no one's going there, yeah, yeah, yeah. or we don't even know it's there. Well, the worst threat for uh, nature is uh, human intrusion, and yeah. overdevelopment, and yeah. you know, so in one way it does protect those areas, and. You know, the fishermen for most of these areas, they are very good stewards yes. of the, the rivers because they realize it's their yeah, living. It's their yeah. living. They want to take care of it. Not only are they catching the fish out of it, but they're, they're eating, sleeping, and everything depends on the, the nature around them. So. Yeah. Here we are at Imperial Tropicals. This place is huge. Each of these greenhouses is full of breeding fish and grow outs. There's another one, two, three, four, five, six more, plus some whole houses full of them. Plus there's actually a whole warehouse that's 10,000 square feet. And we're not even seeing the ponds, which are right over. So then over here are just acres and acres of ponds and the ponds they have covers for heat. And you'd think at 80 degrees would be warm enough, but these are tropical fish we're talking about. And I mean, just to get an idea of how far all of this goes, how many ponds are here? There's 152. 152 of these ponds that are like bigger than a tennis court. Yeah. They're about 30,000 gallons each. 30,000 gallons times 132? Is that what you said? 152. Holy smokes. You guys have to be one of the bigger pond operations then, definitely. Yeah, we're up there. Wow. Very cool and just beautiful. I mean, you guys even, like, you even, uh, uh, what do you, <laughs> I'm landscaped. landscaped. I'm <laughs> like aqua, aqua, aqua. Uh, yeah. You guys even landscaped this place. It's really something special here. This is quite the place. Surrounded by beautiful trees and, you know, the Spanish moss and just, it's, it's gorgeous out here, like a little idyllic farmhouse too. Super cool, love it. All right, so I am here with Mike at Imperial Tropicals and he is about to show us around this incredible place, but we're starting, where are we in, in this farm right now? We're actually in greenhouse number one. This is gonna be a breeding greenhouse and we have African cichlids of Mabuna, peacocks, and hats. Wow, okay. So you've got all sorts of Mabunas and peacocks. I see albino kinds yep. and and haplochromus you keep in here too. Yep. So are they breeding in these tanks or are they growing or what's what's going on in all these bubbling vats? All right, so uh, three quarters of this room is all breeding. So we're gonna have um, a higher concentration of females to males. Okay. So if you see, for example, here we got 12 males and 28 females. Okay, so it's marked right there. Wow, it gets a lot cooler down there. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so you you have it set up and you're just using like PVC or whatever is conducive to how they spawn, right? Yeah, so, yep. so if it were angelfish, it'd probably be like a cone or a slate or something. Right. Uh, yep. But for these, they're cave or nest kind of spawners mostly. Yep. Um, more of like a substrate spawner. Okay. They don't really need the caves. That's more oh. of for females to hide. Oh, the okay. Males will get aggressive. Oh, gotcha. That makes sense. Yeah. So you got to be. I mean, you got to be really efficient because also you don't want to be digging through a, a bunch of aquascape or, or substrate right. clouding up the water. Yep. But I mean, I see already we've got some beautiful fish in here, and so. What what is the rhyme or reason to how this room is 
is set up? Like, what's going on here? Does it does it go by region or just when you start breeding or what's the process? It's uh, it's not set up in any particular way. Okay. It's basically just um, whatever you're breeding at that time. Yep. Okay. Very cool. And so then you've got written on this on the actual vats what's in them. Are these like the um, like a lot of farms use like the coffin liner uh, cement yes, type things, yes, these are, the vaults or whatever yep, they call these them. Are vaults. Very cool. So then there's ruby peacocks. I mean, they've got a whole lot of kinds in here. And just to give you guys a feel for what it's like in here, it's not a hot day down here. It's actually the coolest day I've had in ten days. But it is probably I don't know, ninety to a hundred degrees in here and a hundred percent humidity to the point where it's dripping off of stuff. But that keeps these tanks nice and warm, and uh, also the aeration that's constantly going, that's gonna keep them cool, but aerated, but it keeps them cooler than the ambient temperature, even in the summer. So, do you guys take these black tarps off in like the heat of the summer, or do they always stay on these? Um, for the most part, they stay on there all year round. Okay. The sun is, if not, we get too much algae. Sure, okay, so then it's, yeah, and also an algae thing. And how much water is, each thing going through, I mean, do you cycle through like a whole uh, container of water a day? Um, is it constant or is there a schedule? Or? So each vault is, if it's to the top, it's 220 gallons. Wow. And um, they get anywhere between 50 to 30 percent uh, water exchange per day. Wow. Okay. And then are you pulling that, that out of a well or a municipal? Yeah. Okay, a well. A so a deep well, which is great aquifer water around here probably. Yes. And I'm guessing, do you have to degas it and desulfur it and everything, or we is it? Do not. It's deeper. Okay, We're so. One of the few farms that wow. Don't. So we battle a lot of iron. Iron. Okay. So we're, I don't think a lot of the other farms use the sponge filter, so we use. No. Sponge yeah. A interesting. Lot. A lot of cleaning sponges. Yeah, okay. So you're doing sponge filters. Are they in the pipe or uh, how do you have that set up? Oh, wow. Yeah, it's just a sponge tied to a big pipe. I mean, simple but also works great. Wow. And the, hey, I can see the iron though, like you were saying. So that's really interesting though. But I mean, everybody seems to be colored up and happy, so. I think it, I don't think the iron's that big of a problem for him, no, I guess. No. So, and then so what's going on with this dripping? Is that just condensation or no, is that this overflow? Is overflow? Okay. Each bat, as it's getting new water, it's just overflowing out. So. Okay. Okay. So it just yeah, it just spills over as yeah. new water comes in, and then the aeration is with the sponge. Very cool. So I mean, the sponge is then it's like say you're starting a new tank with nothing in it, like. This one has only a few fish in it, but say you're doing, you're starting a new tank. Do you just jump cycle it by putting a sponge from another one in, um, or? Yeah, we always keep our sponges uh, wet and okay. like, full of bacteria in between fish. Very cool. So they'll never be 100% clean. Cool. Yeah, that's that's really neat. And as we're walking down here, I mean, we've got albino red top zebras, and they have got eight males, 19 females. So that must be kind of a science over time to figure out like what ratio for each species and, and, and stuff like that, right? So like, how does that work? I mean, do you try these out breeding them in a smaller room or tank first or so do you just try it out here? If we have smaller groups of fish, we will start them off in tanks, but we just find the more space you give them, the more apt they are to just start spawning. Very cool. Yeah, they've got a lot of room. I mean, each one, you said, 200 and how many gallons? 220 filled to the top, so a lot wow. of them are sitting at About 150 two. to 180. 180, okay. Wow, and so then when you do get fry, are you guys pulling the eggs and fry out of these tanks to grow out in another spot then? Yes. Okay, yep. so that makes sense. I mean, so it's really a production line of what a home breeder would be doing with cichlids too. Yep. Okay, so it's really, I mean, someone's just... This is just someone's dream come true of every cichlid you could you get your hands on. Just on steroids. On steroids, being bred in a farm. Now these are incredible. These, that color looks like they have a light inside of them. White knights, huh? Yep. Wow. Now what are they? They're a, they're a hap haplochromus. Yep. Okay. Wow, they are so bright. That is super cool. And then just going down, you know, we've got 
more just more varieties of fish on all sides of us uh, down both aisles and here you can see them a lot of them are clearly used to being fed and uh, we got some beautiful yellow colors and black colors in there so do you have a favorite fish in this room that you would uh, say is you know the, the the cichlid you like the most in here I would have to say the white knights they really yeah they the, really pop. those are I mean for standing far away the white or bluish color on them is incredible very cool and so down each row we'll look when we're in the warehouse but we'll see what these fish look like better because you know the bubbling and everything's going on but thank you so much for showing us this room I'm not gonna lie I will be happy to breathe outside of this room yeah. must be rough to work in here like for a long period at a time yeah does it get hard uh, when you're <laughs> yeah sick is brutal especially yeah. in the summer yeah um, in the summer I would say it's on a cool day 120 yeah yeah, I'm like pouring sweat. I came from where it was 20 degrees in Seattle when I left. Yeah, so I'm just, change. yeah, it's a change for sure. But it's so cool to see. Thank you. All right, so we're outside of the tents where all the uh, beautiful African cichlids are breeding and growing out. And here is the big uh, pump with the RO system. So the water they get from their deep well, they then can run through the RO system. And then you guys can treat that is not fish food that is not substrate that is salt to mix up i guess for uh for treating uh any issues but also for probably uh do you use also salt for making tanganyikan type water and stuff or what do you do for um, that our water is actually pretty much perfect it's, right out of the well from tanganyikan wow so you guys have really similar water then to yeah. tanganyikan so it'd probably be fair to say that i mean buying fish from central florida from you guys is really close to what you'd get from getting wild caught fish as far as uh, the water parameters and quality, but then you guys have that extra eye to look for any issues that you wouldn't get from wild caught, and they don't have the stress of being transshipped. So, I mean, this is why I think it's so important for people to see it's not always glamorous, it's not always the beautiful tanks, but there's a lot of hard work, and there's Americans in America working to get these fish to you, and that ends up costing more to make you guys, you know, make a living, but also to bring you a, a really quality fish. And so that's what I want to show in this tour. And I'm so glad that you're, you know, informing me because a lot of this I would I don't know either until you tell me. So I hope nobody's watching this assuming, oh, I knew what that was. No, Mike told me and uh, he's showing me around. So that's that's really interesting, though, that that's a huge R.O system and and even the chambers are huge there so and is that just for these tents or do you use that all this, over this gets pumped over to the breeding room over there okay the south american section. okay so i bet like the uh like the the little small dwarf cichlids probably really like that yeah, yeah okay so you don't use that necessarily for the tanganyikans or they they can just use the well water here yep. very well cool water. very very cool all right, so we just checked out inside this giant breeding tent and saw how they're doing the breeding and the grow out. They're using the water right out of the ground here in central Florida from a deep well. There's another tent just like that first one and another one, and you guys have ponds and more tents. So there's all sorts of stuff going around, but with the pumps, with how the, the vaults are set up with the fish in here, we don't want to waste too much time showing you guys bubbling tanks everywhere, but they're all set up very similar like this. So just believe that these beautiful fish, there's different ones in every single vault that they have here. And we're going to skip to the next step in the process and show what some of the softer water fish that aren't using water straight out of the ground, what their setup like so let's go check that out so now we're walking across and this this facility is huge you know i mean this property has got to be acres and acres 20 acres 20 acres of ponds and greenhouses and warehouses all for breeding fish here in america it's so cool that you guys have this set up here i mean it's a thing that it was big in the 60s and it's kind of been fading ever since and getting smaller and you guys are doing something different that looks successful, you yeah. know? No, it's, it's, uh, it's grown so quickly. Wow. 
Super beautiful. I mean, I can't believe you guys keep these tanks so immaculate. I'm really blown away. Like, uh, most fish farms, the tanks are just, you know, algae everywhere, which uh, it's not necessarily a problem, but you guys can really get an eye on what is going on in every single yeah. tank this way. So, are these just little young discus here, huh? Yeah. And can they grow out at this size without their parents like a slime coat and stuff or do they need to be with the parents for a certain period? So we took them from their parents about two weeks ago. Okay. And they were with the parents for about three weeks. So for the first three weeks they are getting the slime coat from their parents which is protein and uh, essential amino acids as well as it actually has a whole bunch of bacteria. Uh, fungal flora and archaea that discus use to actually pass down their immune system from the parents to the babies while the babies eat and if you haven't ever seen it the babies actually clean the parents and they eat off uh, the lining that comes off from their biofilm and it's a really unique evolutionary uh, trait that they do that but you know discus are such a beautiful fish and it's just so interesting to me that they, they uh, that is the method that they evolved to use. It's, it's very, very interesting. And I know for a long time, you know, before Jack Watley and some of those pioneers, it was uh, a tricky fish to, to spawn. And, and so. it still can be. It still can be, yeah. So now, Mike, you've brought us into this breeding facility. And this is the softer water where that RO water was being mixed up for and stuff. And so, what is going on in all of these tanks and rows and rows of fish? I mean, I see beautiful discus, I see, you know, hy hyphosobercons, so tetras, I mean, what is going on in here? It's just full of amazing stuff. So in this room, we're going to breed our harder, our more, our fish that are more water. Like, like tricky yeah, to breed? Like, yeah, okay. tricky. So we got our discus, they need really soft water. We have our yeah. pistos. And we also have our Tanganyikans on the other side of the room, so... Wow. And then I, I see, like, you guys literally have leaves for tannins and yep. to soften the water even more, yeah? Yep. So you guys are using natural methods to bring the water down, and, you know, salt, just like you'd find in the wild, yep. uh, leaves. So do you guys also add, you know, um, you know, calcium or shells or something like that if you need to harden the water then, um, too? Or does it come out here it already? It comes out hard enough. Okay. In the past, we have used like Tanganyikan buffer. Yeah. But we we found that just do better in our in our well water. Wow. And so if we walk around here now that we know the the magic potion that's going into the water, so you're just basically you're breeding them in here, you're holding them in here, and is this this just uh, does this feed this whole rack then this uh, pump it's system? Just half the rack. It's just a small system. Between, okay. Uh, just mo mostly to grow fish out. You okay. So do you cycle through a lot of water then? I mean, uh, to, yeah. to breed them. Wow, these are incredible colors. So every one of our breeder tanks in here gets at least 150% water change a week. So 150% water change a week at least. And I mean, these are some of the best looking fish I've ever seen in a store period, let alone a farm. I mean, they're all colored up to the max. All these Shelleys and uh, the Neolamprologus are all just electric. I mean, you can tell that they're getting their anthocyanins, their apotaskin, their omega-3s and 6s. All those things you're supposed to read about for color enhancing flakes and stuff. That's what's going into these guys most definitely, along with that quality care and management of the water here that they're doing. So are these little rams or? Yeah, these are German blue rams. German blue ram babies. So just tanks of babies here. So then at what point do you decide this fish has grown out enough, let's move it to like, where does it go next? So a lot of the fish, we will try to get them to the greenhouse in the vats as soon as possible. Okay. Regardless if they're soft water or hard water. Okay. Um, they're just gonna grow so much faster. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. And so then, if we keep going down the line, I just want to show people some of the, the scope and scale. Like, the Shellies are breeding in shells, go figure. And you guys have some kind of unusual stuff, too. I mean, 
it's not just the stuff that you think you know is at a big box type store that some farms focus on you guys are definitely trying uh different stuff so i mean who is the ultimate who, who makes the ultimate decision of what you guys are going to be spawning then? I mean, ultimately, it's uh, my decision and Mike Trotty's decision. But the, the owner of the... Yeah. Okay, very but cool. As a farm, we're all hobbyists, so anytime sure. any of us see a fish we like, we, uh, we see if we can get it and if it works for us. So. Right on. And so in here, you can see just how many babies are in the care of these parents. And so with, with, um, with cichlids that care for their young, do you guys leave them with the parents if that works out? Or um, just for the first few weeks? Or? Usually, so what we found is leaving with a couple weeks. Okay. Until the fry are stronger. It's okay. It's a lot easier to move the fry. Sure. It moves a lot less. Yeah. Um, no and shock and stuff. Yeah, in yeah. the past we would pull the fry right away. And we yeah. found that they do a lot better for leaving for a week or two. Wow, okay, very cool, very cool. Here, here we have the size that you would sell out these fish to the public and over here are the babies and then the adult size so how long does it take you like with this fish how long will these be growing out from that baby size to this kind um, of juvenile or mid-adult size about three to six months three to six months so that's really quite an investment of time space and like workers working on the fish so I think it's important that people know what goes into a fish and why you're paying what you're paying for a quality fish. And these are some beautiful fish. So now we're moving down the softer water row, the more acidic water row. These are apistos, and I love apistos. These are probably one of the most, uh, you know, common apistos with the the double red, the triple red. You get um, things like uh, are these cockatoides? Then yeah. okay, yeah, and. Uh, then we've got the electric blue rams, which are really pretty too. They've got some uh, exuals. Some uh, these are the ones I had in my fish room too. The Turkana jewel cichlids that come from one lake in Africa, and they are the most incredibly bright red fish as adults. I don't think there's a brighter red fish. And then down here, I mean, we've got more fish in every tank on every level. But these ones are really interesting too. So these are gold rams, but they just have a very nice color in the face that uh, I don't see very often. Very cool uh, variety. And then over here, like just to the other side, so that we're kind of capturing it. Holy smokes, they're big. So what are these guys here? These are Heroes Liberifer. They are known as a mouth brooding severin. I yeah. believe they're the only species of severin that are mouth breeders. Wow, they're huge. I mean, I know they get big, but they're uh, they're a good sized fish. So, how do you deal with mouth brooders in mass? Like, what's the process for breeding mouth brooders? So, we will let them hatch out the fry in their mouth. Okay. And after one to two weeks, we will catch the parent out holding the fish, gently open their mouth, yeah, and just kind of judge the, yeah. the fry out of their mouth. And then you'll grow the fry out uh, with special food and for like appropriate for them, huh? Yeah. Yep. So can you tell if they're holding? Like, what's the tell that you know? Um, most fish you can tell. You'll see the chubby cheek. The chubby throat. cheeks and the throat will be kind of flared out all the time. Very cool. And so, are these more uh, of the same, or are these a different variety this here? This is the same. They're really pretty. They've got a subtle iridescence and yeah, very neat. So. You guys are growing out a whole lot of these fish, obviously. So you guys are doing a lot of numbers with these fish. And then yeah. you've got some uh, geophagus here. Yeah. These are Wymillari. These oh, are, nice. These are some we're saving back to grow out for breeders. Wow. They have a long way to go. Yeah, so they take a while. you got to kind of invest in the future as a fish farm, obviously. Yes. Yes. But in here, uh, these are more uh, these are more little dwarf cichlids, apistos, I take it? Nope. No? So these are going to be Nana Akara. Oh, Nana Akara. Okay. Yep. I've had these before yep. then. It's so hard to tell when they're little. Yeah, this is just a small, like, one-inch size. Yeah. So do you guys sell them at about this size, too, then? Yeah, we'll sell them from one to two inch. They're super cute. These ones, uh, sometimes they go by like the golden dwarf cichlid, yeah. I believe. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're a fun fish to have, for um, sure. If you want to see some more fry. Yeah. Oh, wow, we've got itty bitty tiny fry. 
So, I mean, do you just have to check every single day to see what's going on in each tank to yep. know, you know, who's hatching and what's going on? Yep. So these are the latter Pacara Araguay. They're really cool. Yeah, I think the common name is like the dwarf smiling sickly. Yeah, smiling. I, I have a lot of Akara um, at my house right now. The Dia, um, what is it called now? I'm going to space. Dia Dori. Okay. Yeah. Um, super cool fish. Dwarf fry in this tank, same species. Same oh, wow. So, so, I mean, with any fish, not all the babies survive. Like, some are just born weak and so forth. So. Yeah. I mean, do you have any idea how many of these babies, like, for instance, here, are going to make it, probably? I mean, realistically, 75 to 80%. That's incredible. I mean, that's really good. for. I mean, you're, this isn't someone's home where they're, like, staring at it all day. Yeah. This is a farm with lots of other fish, and that's really cool. But there are a whole lot of babies in there, and these are some beautiful fish. Here we've got some really nice dark black rams. You can see they're eating blood worms. They've got the, uh, are those catapa leaves or what do you guys use for um, leaf? We do use catapa leaves but in here is oak leaves. Oak leaves. Nice. And I mean, oh and here's some brand new babies. Brand new babies. Uh, with more black rams. These ones were born on 12-5. Uh, super, super recent, and they're taking care of their young. So with rams, at what age do you separate um, them from there? So rams, their fry are so small, they're very sensitive. So we yeah. give them a week to two weeks, depending on the batch of fry. Okay, that's still, I mean, that's still quite a while, really. Yeah. And as we move down, I mean... You can see some of these breeding tanks, I mean, they're just absolutely beautiful. And the epistle, I mean, they, they look like show tanks. Yeah. <laughs> you guys have got the wood, the sponge filter, they've got substrate to play in, they've got, are these little Monia or uh, the Daphnia? That is Moina. Mo yeah, Moina. Yeah. <laughs> Monia. I'm always saying things wrong. <laughs> So now, have you found that that works as a dither fish, or why are those yeah. in there? So I found that if you add a couple of dither fish in there, that they will spawn a lot better. Yeah. They will almost, they will kind of fight off the dithers together and form a better bond. Interesting. They become better parents. That's really interesting. That's a great tip. I mean, for folks, that's a great tip. And you've got a little spawning cave. I mean, I'm I'm guessing sometimes they use the cave, sometimes they use the wood. It's yeah, just kind of depends on the pair. Yeah, and we can see, looks like the male was poking his head out over there. But they're kind of uh, keeping an eye out for who's 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 patrolling my tank, basically. And here's some uh, larger of the ones we were looking at earlier, too. More colored up. That's the anomaly. Yeah, very pretty with that gold and blue. They're one that's super underrated. I wish pe more people kept those. And then here we've got one of the more uh, popular throughout time, the last few decades, the uh, cockatoides. These are the triple red, but you also get the orange, orange flash and the triple red, double red. So, I mean, do you happen to know offhand what the triple red, double red, like what is the difference between so those? The difference is going to be the red on the fin. So if okay. you look at the fish here, on the pectoral fins, yeah, and then on the anal fin, yep. and on the so uh, those the, lower fins, the top fin, yeah. If it has red on all the fins, it's going to be triple red. That's triple. Okay. So a double red is going to have red on only two fins, like two oh, sets of fins. Got it. Very cool. And the females in these are just absolutely gorgeous too. You can tell the live food and the tannins make a huge difference yeah. too. So here we are looking at another episto and she's got some babies with her that are really young I mean these look brand new they're very young only like less than a week for sure right yeah wow and she's all colored up I mean most people look for the males because they're the quote unquote pretty ones but a lot of episto females are have that band over the eye and yellow and all sorts of different variations but uh, here is the species of the episto and uh, she's beautiful and she's taking care of her babies 
and uh, of course the males and females are going to skirmish around <laughs> and the the female who's got the babies usually lights up the best you know usually has the best color she got the mate she got the best male um, but it's super cool to see I've, I watch them in my tanks literally like putting the babies in their mouth and moving them all over the place oh, yeah. when when they just feel like oh I need to reorganize nice little parade wow that is a beautiful fish right here too what is going on here so this is the histogramma Borrelii opal oh so that's just a beautiful opal does it have like a long fin gene or is that just that's a fully just, mature one that's just a fully mature wow that is a beautiful fish very cool and so they don't have babies right now but you wait until they uh, do and then then you take care of the babies from there after a week or two yep yeah, we will take them and put them in their own tank to grow up right on and you guys even have plants and stuff in your breeding tanks which I don't see in farm setups very often yeah, we don't. that's we don't have it in a lot of tanks but we do well I'm sure some of them just tear it up yeah. uh, <laughs> you know but just beautiful fish in every tank. I mean, I wish we had time to literally do a segment on every fish. These guys are in their condos <laughs> with their big nuchal hump on the males, hanging out in there. Right here too, the buffalo head cichlids. And then over here we've got some really interesting colored discus too. They're all kind of chilling in the corner, but they've got the two big bands on them. Really cool. And so you spawn some of your fish, I notice, you know, you've got cones, mm -hmm. some of them you've got tanks, or uh, uh, longer like tunnels like these, yep. some of them you have condos, so is it just like trial and error that you figure out what works, or you know, like... Yeah, so for every fish too, we, we research as much as we can and try sure. to replicate what they would spawn in in nature. So like this fish, naturally they're gonna they're gonna be spawning in crevices and underneath rocks. So right. we try to give them their own little cave. This is a slender head buffalo, slender buffalo head. They are so goofy looking, but I love them. Yeah. I've got some uh, blue lip buffalo heads oh, at nice. home. Really cool, <laughs> really pretty, and wow! Just got to show her or him. I can't tell yet, but look at that. So that's probably the male? Yeah. That is a huge angelfish. I mean, well, hard to see, but it's it's bigger than my hand with its its runners and, and wow. Koi angels. Just electric color. Wow. These are beautiful. Are these uh the Y Y man or um Y Miller Y Miller yep. you know. so. Beautiful. We and, um, have them paired off, so the big one at the trailers is the male, and the smaller one is the female. Adorable. <laughs> They're so pretty. And then you've got, like, albino varieties, too, huh? So this is the albino threadfin, threadfin acara. Yeah. Or albino pecoline. Really, really pretty, these ones. Not very commonly bred here in the U.S. It's, no. A lot of them are imported, so this I mean, is something we're working on. And they look, I mean, they look incredible. Down here we've got some big old cichlids, we've got some waru, and uh, they're a neat one, they're a, a very large South American cichlid, and they can really take on a lot of different colors and things like that too. Yeah. So do you guys have other morphs of the waru, or is this the, the main like wild, you know? This is the only one we currently have. Yeah. We, we've had had pandas in the past. Yeah. But right now, this is the only one. I mean, these are almost a foot long, the males. I yeah. mean, they're big fish. Very cool. And up here, we've got Geo. more geos. Yep. That's the Y. Miller. That is a huge Y. Miller. That's another foot long Y. Miller, probably. Wow. Incredible fish you guys are breeding. I mean, I'm really, I really am blown away. I know I keep saying that. I'm not just saying that. It is so cool to see a farm where you can actually see what's going on and actually see the quality of the fish and clean tanks I mean that's not a necessity you don't need to have clean tanks but it sure does help I mean I'm sure with spotting issues and yeah. everything else but this is what I mean this is yet again another reason why I think people should be willing to pay a premium of more than even fish lists for 
for quality U.S. bred fish. I mean, they're being cared for like a pet, like better than a lot of people will end up caring for them. So now here's more of those Lake Turkana jewels and none of them are colored up quite yet, but that one is working on it. And I have these fish at home and they, if you guys remember them, they're the ruby red, the like blood red with the blue specks of a color on their uh, dorsal and uh, caudal and uh, pectoral fins, all kind of like a lace pattern. You can kind of see it on this one. And then the ruby red body, they're a really pretty fish. We got, so we've got, wow, big old rainbow fish too. Those take a long time to grow out. Yeah, so this is, uh, these are the dwarf rainbows. The dwarf, yeah. yeah the parva. Yeah, the parva. Yeah. These are uh, Lake Karamu, yeah. Karama. Yeah. Uh, and they've got a nice subtle color, but you have to invest some time to get that rainbow shape and the rainbow color yeah. and everything. These are a little bit past their prime color. They're about six years old. Okay, so, so they're they're even older than, than prime. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and then we've got some little, uh, are these nanochromous or what? Um, these are some rainbows that just happened. Yeah, these are nanochromous splendens. I love them. Beautiful fish. I love nanochromous. I love the transvestia, uh, transvest Nidus, transvestus, yeah. I can't remember how, how the end, transvestus, yeah, and then the splendens, and then there, I mean, there's so many cool ones there, and they keep finding more, Anton uh, Lamboge always lists them on his Facebook when he's out exploring, and I'm always just like, Such a stunned cool by, they're like a slender crebensis that kind of hops around almost like a goby, they're a really neat fish to keep and I think more people should know about them. They're not that hard to keep as long as you keep the water quality good. Um, they're a really cool fish. There they go and they get very, very colorful. These guys are just being shy and it's a little dark. All right, so here we are going into, I mean, we just walked from over there, we checked out in there. Now we're going to another set of tents. I mean, there's mo whole other greenhouses here, but We've got more in here. You can see the overflow. We're gonna go into a, a heat blast in here. But it's not as bad as the the other one was, that's for sure. And what are we growing out in these vats? So we have some tetras that we're fattening up to breed. Um, the females come in the vats. And we'll put them in, in the breeding room to breed them. So female tetras in that one, and then uh, Sabwa resplendent. So so that's the uh, orange rummy nose, uh, a rasbora, right? Yeah. I mean, it's not really a rasbora. I think they call it the naked rasbora, or uh, the naked rummy nose. Yeah, it's like a beautiful blue color with an orange nose. They're from Lake Inlay, and they're a really cool species, even though they're not actually. So all the rest of the fish down this row are going to be rainbow fish breeders. Okay. Uh, so rainbow fish all down this row, huh? Some are um, location specific, some are not. Wow, so Parva, Tuna Creek, is that Puna Creek? Yeah, yeah. oh, the Radnocentris, yep. yeah. Yep. Is it, do you guys do Siri Creek too, or do you just stick with one type we of have rad? The Siri's Creek also. Very nice. They're a really beautiful fish in sunlight too. We try to keep them far as far as possible so there's no uh, potential to hybridize. Yeah, that makes sense. So you keep, uh, when you have several of the same uh, species in the same pen. You try to keep them as far away from one another as possible. That yeah. totally makes sense. And so with rainbows, it makes sense you're also just, and this is what you do at home, like yep. literally a, a acrylic or yarn, you know, just spawning mark, mop. Yep. Very cool. A piece of styrofoam. Piece of styrofoam to float them. And these vats or vaults are set up in the same way in that they've got the overflow, also sponge filtration in here too? Wow, and so it's all set up that way. And then, oh wow. So this is where we'll hatch them. This is a very small spawn, but you can see the tiny oh, yeah. fry in there. Yeah, I can see some of the fry hanging out in there. And there, there's more when your eyes adjust. But, so this is what, when you, do you pull all the mops or do you rotate what mops you're pulling or? Or do you just do one mop in the in the vaults at a time, or what's the? We'll do one mop 
in each vat. In and each vat, okay. Every week we'll pull them off, sometimes daily. Okay. And we'll pull them off, put it in here to hatch out. Very cool. That's a cool way to do it. It's labor intensive, but it's very cool. Yeah. And so, I mean, they've got just a whole bunch, a bunch of Bozmani in here. Here's the Ceres Creek. I've kept these before as well. And so there's no mop in here yet, right? right. Could there be spawn in there if there's no mop in there? Um, so currently it looks like he does not have a, he does have a mop, so. Okay, so that might get pulled tomorrow, the next day, yeah. whatever. And then do you comb through them by hand or do you just let them hatch into there? We just let them hatch. Okay, in. that makes sense. That makes sense. I was going to... That would be a lot. Yes. And in here, it looks like fern gully. It looks like nature is trying to take back your your tent. <laughs> yeah. So what's going on here? Is this the filtration for this tent? So this is a peacock bass breeding pool. Whoa. Um, you can't see in it right now. If you look, Oh, I you see one, yeah. See He's huge. One spawn, we had about 1,200. 1,200 baby peacock bass from the... Is this like a 1,000 gallons or... Uh, this is big. This is more than a 1,000. This is okay. probably... Like, right now it's probably 1,500. I think yeah. it's 3,000 to the top. Wow. Wow. And same with this, I would assume, then. Yeah, this one had... Uh, this is a project that we've been working on. You might... Oh, there oh. Is that a gar? These are Florida gar with the, uh, I don't know if you followed us at all, we have the yeah. gold gar. Yeah, so yeah. These all have the gold gene. So these have the gold gene, and was that from the Florida Aquaculture Center? Is Was it their gold gar that, that you guys? That was our gold gar. Oh, that was your gold yeah. gar that they had at one point that I saw. Like, they, um, they had a platinum and a gold gar of some kind, like five, six years ago, that was young. So, yeah, so ours was wild caught. Oh, okay. So your you guys have your own then. Yeah. That is awesome. And, and then fried. it's it's offspring. We are gonna try to breed them back to him. So you're gonna try to breed increase our eyes. So okay. Right. So you'll have babies. So this is a really long term project. Yeah. So you have a Florida gar in here. It has babies. The babies then have a probably very recessive gene. Right. So the babies will then be saved. They'll be bred back with the parent again. Then those babies will probably be separated and bred back with the parent one more time if they're not expressing. If we have to. If you have to, yeah. And then you'll probably diversify amongst the babies. The right. yeah. Wow. But there's about we have about twenty to thirty inside. They're not all in here. Yeah. And then the rest of them we are growing out into in a pond. Wow. And is this? Is this the the OG, the original gold one that's in here, or? Okay. So the gar that did come by, is he just a normal color one that's spawned from the other one, or is this one that you've crossed with that gold one? So we cr we crossed the gold one with another one from the same part of the river. Okay. They both had the gene. Yeah, yeah. But they didn't. Okay. Or, well, they might have. They might. Yeah. It didn't show. Anything, yeah. So. Yeah. And do they spawn just a ton of babies, or? It was huge. Wow. Huge spawn. More wow. than we, we were ready for. It. Yeah, I'm sure. And then is this just food, basically, and and dither fish kind of yeah, thing? Just uh, food. Yeah. Wow. Super cool. That is really cool. Okay, so we're growing out on this side. We're down from the Gold Gar project, and we're growing out. I see. So there's lots of little baby warus in there. Those big old round-headed cichlids from South America. Tiger severum in here. Tiger severums. That's, those are bright. Let me, uh, and, let me show you this and then in here we've got, uh, what are these? Tretocephalus. Tretocephalus. Oh yeah, there they are. I see them now. They're really pretty. So he's going to try to fish out some of the actual fish, because you guys are probably seeing the, are there some dithers in there? Yeah. 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 So there's, it looks like there's some sword tails or mollies or something that are red, but he's going to get us some to show us, just specially for you viewers. So, oh, you can pull a whole tank almost yeah. with these nets the way they are, huh? Yeah, they're uh, specially made to fit in the bass. Yeah. So you can, you can catch everything at once if you want it. 
specially made so you can scoop everybody out at once. Right on. Holy smokes, he's huge. I was not expecting it to be that big. A wild tiger severum. Wow, he's a powerful fish, I can tell just by looking at him. Wow. Beautiful. <laughs> Beautiful fish. It's four bats. Right now this one's just getting clean. So this is the Moena situation. And you do you just grow like a spirulina or a green algae for them? Yep. And then you just breed them out? And... Yeah, so here... Oh, I can see the water just rippling with yeah. life. And uh, just for example, this is a little bit bigger than a brine shrimp net. Yeah. Just so... Um, oh yeah. Some little red bugs in there. Look at the carotenoids and the fats in that. All the protein and the good stuff. That is what makes healthy fish. Man, that's awesome. Yeah. Nothing better pound for pound than those. Oh, it's good. We do daphnia, but they don't breed as good for us here. Yeah. The... Yeah, these and daphnia beat out brine shrimp, blood worms, everything yeah. as far as having like a balanced nutrition but profile for smell. for many. Yeah, oh yeah, the smell. Yeah. Yeah, kind of a sulfury, swampy kind of smell, yeah. Alright, so we're looking at all these ponds, 152 of them, tennis court sized ponds. So, being in Florida, I know you gotta have pests and, oh, yeah. I mean, I see birds at every fish farm, but what do you guys do about Yes, I mean about birds and what else comes in here? So we get gators, we get Gator. all kinds of turtles, otters. The biggest one though is going to be birds. Birds, and okay. what we do is we have air cannons at every corner of the farm. That's super humane. <laughs> yeah, about for the first three or four hours of the day in the morning, yeah. the birds are the worst. So yeah. we run them in the morning. And does that just blow air or does it make a loud noise or? It's just a loud propane okay. noise. Okay, okay. It's just a big boom. Boom, yeah. okay. I'm sure the neighbors love that. Yeah, I'm sure they do. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, so you were saying though that even a, 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 a body of water the size of these, an otter can wipe that out in a couple days or oh, in a yeah. day? No problem. Wow. They'll, they'll bring their family, they'll just come and... Wow. Are they adorable though? They are very cute. <laughs> Everyone wants to see them when they show up. Yeah. Luckily, it's not that often. So they just make their way up through the the drainage trails and stuff, yeah? Yeah, yeah. And is that where the alligators come from, too, if they get in? Yeah, yeah. There's Usually a, small ones, I assume? or Yeah, we'll get small ones, or during the mating season, we will get larger ones that did, they lost a fight. Oh, so they, they got to find a new territory. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wow. And so... Explain to me a little bit before we kind of get an, uh, an idea of just how big this farm is. So you said this farm is over 50 years old too? Yeah. So I believe Mike's parents started it. Wow. And uh, it's changed a lot since they started it. Yeah. Originally it was just a couple of greenhouses and mostly just pond work. And angel fish for competition and stuff? Yep. Yeah. And so in 50 years they've built all of these ponds, the indoor... I mean, now things are on the internet. I mean, to think about what's changed in 50 yeah. years and they are still in business and bigger than ever, right. that is a, I mean, that's quite a, a shout out to Mike and you guys yeah. for all your hard work. Um, that's really cool. Very adaptable. Yeah. So underneath these, does this keep just the heat in? Does it keep the birds out? What's the main purpose of covering up a, a pond like this when when we see this. So the main thing is to keep the temperature of the water up. So okay. At night, even though it's warm here during the day, being that it's winter, it can drop down to 60 degrees. Yeah. 40 degrees in the dead of winter. So yeah. Anything to keep the water temps up for these tropical fish. Okay. And so, I mean, do you keep any of the really hot species out here, like angels and discus and stuff like that? Um, or do you angels have... Angels will do fine underneath the plastic. They will. Yeah. Okay. Very we cool. We never put uh, discus in the pond. So. I'm sure that, I mean, you'd have to have a lot of discus yeah, too. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's really cool. And then when it's time to get things out of the ponds, what's the process look like to get uh, all the fish out after they've been growing and so, being fed every day and all that. If you look at this pond over here, yeah, we'll pump it down to a, what we call a saneable level. <laughs> a sane level. <laughs> yeah, so you can get the sane net. The sane in there. net, yes. And what we'll do is we'll try to attract the fish to one side. Okay. We'll, so we'll throw food. And then kind of work it, yep. like. And we'll just have two people go down each side, 
and seine them in, and then from so, there we catch them out of the seine net and bring them into the greenhouses. And so, I mean, these look kind of like steep drop-offs on some of these. They are so, pretty steep. So, yeah, so you guys have to be kind of careful, huh? Yeah, it's pretty slippery. Now, what is this? Is that a tail drag, or is that just, you know, equipment or something that, is that left the, that? That um, is the hose uh, okay. from the pump. Yeah. That pumped it down. I was gonna say you either have like a 15 foot gator in there <laughs> <laughs> or I'm <laughs> off I'm completely <laughs> off yeah wow that's super cool well let's get an idea of just how big this is if if folks are wondering and we'll do it high speed so the Tanganyikan hobby definitely needs saving I mean it's one lake with all that diversity and they've even seen new species forming because of human activity in the last 60 years yes so it's wild. I mean, it's really neat to see you guys carrying yeah. so many different Tanganyikans. And the lake, not only is it uh, being threatened with uh, pollution and invasive fish, but right. it's also getting overfished. Yeah. Um, you know, you'll, if people are tuned in to what's going on the lake, the locals are catching everything that they get in a net and eating it, right? Yeah. They're drying it out, making sardines out of it. So it's getting a tremendous amount of pressure. So we put quite a bit of effort into breeding King and Ethans ourselves because they're not as easy to breed, so they're not as readily available on the wholesale market. And they're and not, yeah, they're not going to be living in a flooded jungle where there's pockets where they're safe and things like that. I mean, yeah. they're stuck. And it's it's really cool that, you know, that that hobby exists. Just like, um, you know, another one that doesn't get as much uh, love always, but uh, it is important is like Goodyeads. Yes. They've reintroduced fish from hobbyists back into the wild, like the San Marcos. Uh, and I mean, I think that's a story we might see with time with, yeah. with Lake Tanganyika, hopefully. Well, that's a future project for us is to work with more of the live bear wild types. Yeah. Because um, we have bred them before. I've had two or three different types of duty it's breeding, but the demand for them was right. like zero. People I need mean, to know they're out so, there, yeah. You know, that's where, you know, I think if you get a better job, Letting people know how unique and special they are, that it would encourage people to keep them more. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's it's why I have worked pr uh, personally with um, Project Piaba, ARCOF, which is the Amazon Research Center for Ornamental Fish, with uh, um, uh, Anthony Maserol, Dr. Anthony Maserol, and uh, also I started a nonprofit with uh, Ivan Mikolji out of uh, Venezuela. Yeah. And um, that is our focus, is those countries and those places that are like the Pantanal, where it's a unique thing and people don't even know the fish exists there. Yeah. Yeah. So it's so important when, you know, I can do my part to try to educate on my channel. You do your part to bring them in and breed them. I mean, we all have a role to play from wholesale down to keeper. And it's so cool that you're transparent and open and like spending the time to talk with the other half of you know the critical. puzzle this is uh the electric blue core and that's oh yeah that's that fish is drawing new people into the hobby sure and that's that's what we like about some of the man-made variants is yeah that yeah you're more natural fish keepers they don't like the man-made variants but sure. you know I've, I've always been able to have a good argument with those debates saying hey this is bringing new people in yeah so, they learn yeah. about the electric blue Acara. Yeah. At some point, they're going to learn about the actual Acara, blue Acaras. Right. Top. Right. Those are growing in popularity. You know. Right. Back when they're colored up, I like them just as much as the electric blues. There, there is definitely yeah. something to be said about subtlety, yeah. also. You know, especially if you have a, like a planted tank or a, a biotope. Yeah. There's something that iridescence in a tannic tank also just sparkles like magically, you know. And what it does is it helps people, you know, like you know yourself and Ivan who are trying to, to, you know, reach people and let them know how vulnerable, vulnerable, uh, vulnerable, vulnerable yeah, vulnerable I got you. These fish are in nature. That hey, you know what? A person might watch a video and see, you know, something that draws their interest. And right helps protect those fish well and, and in a lot of cases uh it's not that they're being overfished it, it's also that the fishery isn't big enough in yeah. some cases and the locals will take care of the fish and if they have a little bit of education you know on uh on aquaculture and 
that's also something that you know I try to mention, but that you know a lot of these have potential to be even bred down there, for instance, yeah. or they could. Um, and we're seeing more of that. Brazil, yeah, Brazil's got a lot of yeah, they have breeding programs going on. Colombia's breeding a lot of fish uh, because it's um, a lot of times those fish are seasonal in the wild, or they're a long ways from you know getting them out of the wild to ship out so you're seeing more and more right. you know, breeding projects set up the high cosmos luteus that you filmed in the big show yeah team. are those we, them up there uh, no oh okay we actually went down to uh, Argentina to collect some and learn more about them and the natives um, the locals they, they actually have them for food stores. oh wow yeah, they, like they're in the market yeah, stalls they, they sell them. yeah so, you know when I went down there I was looking at a fish that might cost Two thousand U.S. dollars right. being sold on a, in a fish market for like two, three dollars a pound. Right. You know? So. Well, and I mean, people don't realize either that certain things like these, these are beautiful. These blue uh, or these uh, turquoise. Yeah, I'll turn the lights on too. So rainbow fish. Yeah, I mean, even without too much oh, light, yeah. they're really beautiful. Um, oh yeah, there we go. Let there be light. Now the rainbows are. Uh, this Fish. These are of a great size. I mean, you can sex them right away. They're be they're really well colored. And that's another one that's growing in popularity because uh, oh, you people that know that hey, these go they, they're, they're from where the rainbows come from. So yeah, they actually go in quite well with uh, uh, rainbow community tanks. Uh, yeah, I love keeping those with um, you know some pseudomagills of some sort or yeah. or some praycocks. They're they're awesome. Oh yeah. Yeah. Those are are beautiful, yeah. Another underrated one is the Doherty eye rainbow fish. You can see the males just starting to get some good color on this. So the Doherty eye rainbow fish, another under uh, recognized fish, probably because it takes time for them to get their 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 color and their shape, but really fun to watch throughout the day they change too they do. and I, I think the problem that a lot of people have with certain rainbows is they only want to keep melts right uh, if you really want to see that fish like you, you fire up to their best colors you need to have some females in there right too. and even further than that a couple they really should set up breeding groups of just one species in a tank right that way you'll you'll be able to observe that fish in its best colors and sure this is a good example of the multi spumata. Like, they don't have much color if you just had a male in a tank. Sure. But you can see a couple of those bigger males that are really starting to, to get some good color. Because oh, yeah. And the, <clears throat> yeah, that, that kind of copper and rust with the blue and the red and crimson, it's beautiful. Same with the thread fin. Rainbows, thread yeah. fins are one that I had no idea also that these have like four or five collection points that are not as popular in the U.S. yet. And some have the, the um, they have different colors on their tails and things. And I had no idea until just the other, like a few days ago. Yeah. It's wild. No, I'm, there's so many different rainbows um, that yeah. are in the wild that are not in the U.S. lobby. It's, um, These are another great one. They get a little bigger, but very cool. I love all, all the rainbows that you have. I mean, yeah. I think it, seeing wholesale level or at least large scale level rainbows is another encouraging thing because you're in it for the long haul. Yeah. This is not a turn and burn fish. No. Uh, and it needs care too. I mean, it needs special care to a certain degree. It's not hard, super hard, but it's... Well, they need to be on the right path of success. Right. That's why... Those are beautiful you know, too. We try to encourage um, you know, them to keep females with them and not just do males, you know. But, right. I mean, a lot of your, you know, bread and butter sure. types, they don't have to have a female in thing, but they'll even look better if there is both sex. Sure. Thing, you know? Wow, th that is a huge female yeah, right there. Female. Wow, she's like so. six or seven inches. That is wild. Now, are these a millennium one? Yeah. Yeah. Albinos, yeah. So. They're showing off quite good color for their they size. Are. Yeah. I have to believe diet, weather, care, all that stuff probably helps, huh? Yeah, and one thing is, is that they've been They've been raised indoors. They okay. Can, uh, throw out areas not in ponds. Most of your albino fish do not do well outdoors. Oh, they yeah. They probably get burned too. So they, they actually will color up 
had a smaller size, which diet obviously helps a lot. Yeah. But if they were grown in an outdoor pond that's 30,000 gallons, they'll grow really fast. Like the peacocks are a good example. The African sure. peacocks, they, ours don't color up till three, three and a half. They start getting good color. But if we raise that same fish indoors, they'll start calling up at two, two and a half inches because of the growing space. Yeah. So. Yeah, it, it's incredible. I mean, even just like your discus, seeing how fast you can grow them yeah. versus like, I don't know, in my tank at home where I'm casually feeding them. Yeah. Uh, it, it's a big difference. These uh, community fish are, are really beautiful too. I mean, if someone wants to put together kind of a, an African community. Yeah, the Mabunas are, are still very, very popular, especially with new people getting in. They want a colorful fish that is easy to maintain and there's really nothing better than a, a, a Mabuna tank. Right. Because you get all different colors. As long as you're keeping just Mabunas together, they're, they're usually very good with each other, even though they do have a high aggression. You can throw in a few Synodonis for yeah. some flair if you want or whatnot, or even a Pleco. Depending on the plug-up. <laughs> so Magunas are still, you know, very popular. One thing that's not, you know, popular yet, but I hope it, it, yeah. it turns is some of the newer Maguna types. Oh, sure. Because they're, um, you know, they are more rare, more expensive. Yes. Some of them don't color up until they get to a bigger size. Yeah. Um, this Chalumba here is a good example. Chalumba, huh? Yeah, they're very wow, shy. They're, yeah. I mean. You, you can know. see the potential in the color oh, there yeah. on that male. Wow. Yeah. And the activity, I'm sure, is fascinating. It is. I mean, they have, uh, even though they're several generations from the wild, they still have that wild, you know, behavior instinct. You know. Ochre. Chalumba. Chalumba. Interesting. I always love dwarf cichlids, too. You know, the, the nanostone, uh, nanochromis and the, uh, the little, you know, everything. I, it started with cribs. Yeah. Honestly. And then you have too many cribs. <laughs> yeah. These uh, red cheek uh, trophy ops are. Um, oh, wow. They became really popular too because they, they have low aggression um, compared to the whole trophy ops family is very more docile and <laughs> you know. Yeah. Compared to the erratics. Beautiful. And then you got a mixed tank right here. Yeah. Super cool. Well, again, I can't thank you enough for yeah. showing us around this place. And I mean, the scale of it is really hard to communicate, but I hope folks will check you guys out. Where can they find you? I mean, seems obvious, but <laughs> where can they find you uh, if, if they'd like to order some fish? Yeah, so they could buy from the website, Imperial Tropicals. Um, okay. And then what I encourage them to do is like do some research on us. Like, yeah. Um, one thing that makes me, you know, very uh, proud of our uh, company is our reviews. Like, yeah, you know, if you if you go to a, you know, fish store online, you should go look at their reviews because if they're doing a good job, yeah, it's going to say it. And yeah. I mean, we have some negative reviews, but the, the that means the you're leaving have, them, though. <laughs> you know, those are good exit times for us to <clears throat> hopefully show somebody else what that person needed to do. Right. Anyway. Like right. It was communicate what those are. Well, this is a hard, ha I mean, hard business in that yes. someone can be not doing their part yes. and they'll say it came from this end. But I, I mean, I can say just from being around so many fish in my life and so many shops and things, yeah. I mean, these are incredibly healthy and happy looking fish. Yeah. And they're coming from here, so yeah. I mean. <laughs> and we get new people that, you know, they buy unsexed uh, peacocks and hats. Sure. And Hey, it doesn't have any color. I'm upset. Right. Like, well, you know, make sure before you buy any live animals online, you do proper research. Cause, right. Right. You know, when you buy one to two inch unsexed fish and read the description. Yeah. What do you expect? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, we're dealing with a lot of you know people that are new to the hobby and sure. We want to educate them. You know, we want them to know what to expect in the future when they buy fish from us, and even if they don't get it from us, wherever they get it from, we want them to take good care of them. So I, I think that's also great that you're encouraging folks, even if you're not getting it from you guys, I mean, support the hobby as a whole. I've got some of these guys at my house right now. The, the full grown ones are incredible. I've got the, um, uh, 
Malungu collection point yeah. that Lawrence Kemp brought back. He lives in Seattle. Oh, I'm, I'm, I love Lawrence. And uh, oh, is he? Oh, yeah. good. Yeah. Him and I go collecting in in Washington whenever we get a chance. Yeah. So, yeah, I, he's he's one of my favorite yeah. fish people. All his his yeah. African tanks are oh, incredible. Trips, I, I love. I know. Trips. <laughs> I, Facebook know, stalked that guy. I'm not gonna lie. Yeah, we're <laughs> yeah. not we're not hard to find as far as um, all you got to do is Google. Imperial Tropicals, you'll find out right on. what we're all about, and then we also have social media, cool. Facebook, Instagram, uh, we also have a Facebook group, Imperial Tropicals Fish Keepers, which okay. has been key to our success with getting people to be better at keeping fish, because yeah. um, it's a place we can send people to be around other like-minded people to learn from. I learned stuff from the group. You know, it's been just an amazing uh, journey with, with that. Well, I mean, I love this hobby because you're never going to learn it all. If you think you did, you're there's yeah, something yeah. wrong. <laughs> no, absolutely. Like, you know, we do it at a professional level. And yeah. We're still learning and very open to learning more. So, there, there, yeah, I tell people there's a... Uh, there's no right way to keep a fish, but there's a few wrong ways. Yeah, that's absolutely right. <laughs> and uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you so yeah. much for sharing. I'll end on the note of an adorable puffer. Uh, everybody loves the puffers. Yes. And uh, thank you so much again for your time. Yeah. So thank you guys so much for coming along for the ride with me down there. I know this was a long episode, but I thought it was all just so fascinating and I cut hours of footage. So thank you so much to Mike and Mike down there at Imperial Tropicals, but thank you so much to you guys who are members. If you like this long form com content, if you like when I go down to Florida from Seattle where it's uh, it's actually uh, about 15 degrees right now and uh, it's uh, snowing and uh, sleeting, but in any case, if you like me to travel and do all these things, it's it's only possible because of the memberships and the Patreon and the Super Chats and all the things like that that allow me to do the research and then allow me to go fly down there and give you guys tours like this uh, as well as meet incredible people along the way. So thank you guys so much for that. If you want to continue that, I'm sure you guys know what to do. And of course, liking, sharing, and uh, 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 subscribing are all really helpful things if you guys want to help out the channel just that bit, bit much more. Uh, also, check out the community tab for extras that I put in there, uh, all sorts of behind-the-scenes stuff. So, thanks for watching, you guys. Have a great holiday season if you're watching this when it just came out. And if you're watching this later, have a great day. Well, have a great day anyways. Alright, guys, I'll see you next time on The Secret History, Living in Your Aquarium.